So I'd like to begin by saying good evening and welcome to Grow and Joyce. Um, a writer of, from your Wikipedia entry, speculative fiction. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it means, it'll do. Uh, no, nobody knows what it means, I don't think. But um, multiple award-winning author, uh, winner of the O. Henry Award, the British World Fantasy Awards, the Angus Award, and the Grand Prix de l'Imaginaire. Um, I love this bit of the story. In 1988, uh, Graham quit his day job to live on a Greek island, where he wrote his first published novel, Dreamside, and I think there's a kind of wish-fulfillment fantasy within that for all of us. Um, his most recent novel is Some Kind of Fairy Tale, which was published last year, I believe. Yeah. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about Graham's um, career to date um, in a little while. Uh, but first, uh, I invite Graham to read for us. Right. So, right. can you please give a round of applause to Graham Joyce? Thank you very much. Um, Okay, so uh, since this is a horror evening, I thought um, I'd find something with a demon in for you. You like demons, don't you? You do, don't you? Um, everybody likes demons. This is this um, this is a book I wrote called Memoirs of a Master Forger, a couple of books back, and I published under the pen name William Heaney, but in America it was published under my own name. But it was originally supposed to be. William Heaney's Memoirs of a Master Forger by Graham Joyce. Uh, like, I, I don't know what, what happened uh, Publishes on that. the way. Yeah, I don't, well, we thought it was a good idea because the, the narrator is, um, is this character called William Heaney. And it was all about books within books within books. And there are, I've always been sort of fascinated by that Arabian Nights notion of books inside books, books nesting inside books, stories nesting inside stories. So I had a I had a um, a story that nests inside the novel, if you like, and it and it's um, yeah I sold it as a as a standalone short story to um, Paris Review because I always try, try and sell things twice if I can because you know publishers will <laughs> never publish something that's already been published before, but sometimes you can get away with it if you write a story that's part of the novel. So you know. I'm always saying, comrades, say it twice, so much twice. Anyway, um, it, it, it does stand alone, but it, 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 it gives you the wrong impression of the novel. The novel is really set in London, contemporary novel set in London, whereas the standalone story is the story of a, um, a sergeant in the British Army that, that, that kind of had lost his mind in, in, in the first Gulf War. Which, like you know, the late, the latest Iraq war was ten years ago, incredibly, as it seemed. As it seemed, I like another ten years before that was the first one, and um, the main character is is um, is what's called a colour sergeant in the ranks of the British Army. Um, basically, these are the guys that that know what they're doing. They, they they're not allowed to become officers. So it's like this very class structured thing. That if you're working class, you can't become an officer. You've got to get commissioned. But these are the kind of hardened soldiers, very clever, uneducated soldiers who basically tell the officers <coughs> what needs to be done. But he, 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 he's out of his time really, he's an old fashioned sort of soldier, um, Belfast and the Falklands and things like that, whereas what happened in the, in the Falklands was, it, it, what happened in, uh, in the First Gulf War was new weapons, photo bombs, all sorts of strange stuff going on. And it, it wasn't the kind of fighting that he was accustomed to. It, it, it was something you did to an enemy you didn't even see. Whereas his 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 sort of fighting was very different, and he 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 kind of lost his mind over it. So I'm going to kind of like drop deep into the into the story, so it doesn't take too long, and give you the bit up until he encounters the demon that he fe feels he uh, he thinks he met in in the desert. The terrain suits us. There's a slight rise on our eastern flank, so I can get a couple of lads out there to attack the position while we give for it covering fire with the cannon. Brewster and Dorky volunteer, as do one or two others. I give them the nod, and then for some reason, I don't know why, I decide I'll go and hold their hands. It's not that they need me. There's just stuff bothering me. Can't put my finger on it. 
I ordered the driver to power up and move on 50 yards to fire a couple of white FOSS grenades to make a smoke screen so as we can drop out and flit over and get behind the rise, hopefully unnoticed. When we reach the rise, we can see a burned out Iraqi tank on the, on the sand, maybe just 100 yards away. We scope it out. There are bodies or bits of bodies lying around. No life, it's all clear. It's a bit of useful cover and we go up behind it to set our gear up to help the warrior make its fire on the Iraqi bunker. Fucking hell, says Dorky. He's looking at a torso nearby. Or at least, I think it's a torso. But it still has arms and legs. It's a weird shape. Trunk. Nasty. Never mind what's around you, I bark at him. Get operational! But Brewster and Dorky are paralysed by this thing, mesmerised. It's an effort for them to look away. So I speak to them. <laughs> <laughs> it's an effort for them to look away. Come on, lads, I say. Deep, low growl. Training kicks in and they go to it. Fumbling a bit, fidgety, hyper, but they set up. And I look at this thing, but out of the corner of my eye. Because I don't want the lads to see that I'm freaked by it too. And I am. I'm freaked. It's a corpse of a kind, of an Iraqi soldier spilled out of the tank. Part of his head's gone, but most of the rest of him is there. Well, I can't see hands and feet. None of that bothers me. I've seen enough bits of bodies in my time, and after a while, it's no different to what's in your burger. But this thing, it's a body, but it's shrunk to maybe a third of the size it should be. It crossed my mind it might be a kid, but it's bearded, and anyway, it's not like it's a kid. It's like the whole thing has twisted like a plastic bag when you set fire to it. And it's left a spooky shadow behind, a man-shaped shadow on the sand. The boys are set up and ready, but I've got to shift this bloody mess. I step over to the thing and I try to side-foot it under the tank, out of eyesight, but my foot passes straight through part of it. Nothing turns my stomach. My guts are cast iron, but for the first time in years and years, my bowels soften. Some of the thing sticks to my foot. I scrape sand and debris and push as much of it as I can under the tank. I turn back. Dorky and Brewster are watching me now. All set up, lads? Son! Brewster radios the warrior and we watch the slow elevation of the cannon before it locks. There's a pause before the warrior launches its bombardment of the Iraqi place emplacement. Dorky watches the results through binoculars and reports what's happening. I have to make a mental effort not to think about this goo stuck to my boot. Give him a strafing. Chain gun, Brewster tells his radio. There's not much more. After the cannon and chain gun have softened them up, they all come out and all we have to do is point our weapons. These are not Republican Guard. These are conscripts. They've had enough and they're stumbling out with their hands on their heads. They seem to think we're the Yanks. The, their idea of being a prisoner is try to talk to us in Iraqi. After the prisoners are pa passed back down the line, the mopping up pattern is repeated. The only thing that's changed is the dust. The tanks and the armoured vehicles are kicking up so much dust and sand that it's getting hard to see further up ahead. We're proceeding pretty much by radio coordinates and infrared activity. We stop a couple of times to check out a destroyed tank or other vehicle and we keep spotting these shrunk plastic bodies with their shadow casts. And all the time I'm thinking, what weapon is it that shrinks a human being but doesn't destroy a tank? I mean, the tanks are burned but the shell is intact. I have to break up little groups of boys standing mesmerised over these shrunk bodies. Don't look at it, lads, press on! About another 10 kilometres ahead, we get radio directed to another clear up. Same as before, a few salvos to loosen the sand around them, then in we go. The Iraqis are pouring out like ants from a poisoned nest. But I don't want my boys to get complacent. There are always diehards, and I want no rush. Buy the book, me, and I'm dedicated to bringing all my boat boys home with their trousers on. The dust and the sand are being swirled around by a strong breeze coming from the east. It smells of spice and engine smoke, and this other stuff I don't like. And it's choking, so we have to go in now with scarves over our faces just to stop your nose and mouth filling up. This time I peel off with five of my boys. 
Dorky and Brewster amongst them. From somewhere up ahead there's a sniper fire coming at us, but it's being fired pretty wildly into the dust. We get down behind an escarpment. They know the drill. I'm going out very wide. They're going to crawl on their bellies at spread intervals but stay in visual range, using the dust storm as cover. Meanwhile I've got my other boys noising up the warrior's chain gun to draw fire and support our attack. Our yomp off may be 300 metres wide. I can hear the report of the sniper as he fires on the warrior, but I can't see him. The dust gets thicker. There's a strong breeze picking up and I can't tell you how much of this dust is generated by vehicle movement and how much is natural wind-blown sandstorm, but it's swirling and lashing about like a sand lizard's tail. I look across the line. The dust is so strong I can barely see Brewster, who is my nearest support. I wave at him. He sees me and I point to my eye, warning him to stay in visual range. And the next man. I don't want to be shot by my own troops. Happens all the time in combat. Brewster gives me the thumbs up to show he understands. We make slow progress towards the Iraqi emplacement. They're still firing infrequently and wildly. I have an instinct there's only two of them, maybe 300 metres away. I'm going on my belly. Then the dust whips up again, suddenly and aggressively. You can actually see the sand in the air turning in spirals. A whipper will, a dark thing like a live creature, part smoke, part sand. And the dust is so thick I've lost sight of Brewster. If he remembers his training, he'll stay exactly where he is until we re-establish visual range. But at the moment I can't see more than maybe seven or eight metres ahead of me in the gritty yellow fog. We're all radio disarmed. Nothing like somebody squawking through your set when you're on your belly six inches away from the enemy. Maybe I could use the radio safely with this wind and racket going on, but I don't want to risk it. We wait. Behind the wind I can hear our artillery pounding the Iraqi dugouts a few miles ahead. Then I can't even hear that. After a while the sandstorm begins to ease. I have a thin cotton scarf over my mouth and it's almost stiff with the dust lodged in it. My eyes are stinging and sweat is dribbling along the curve of my spine. I'm scoping out the spot where I last saw Brewster, but even though the dust is clearing, I can't see him or anyone else. What I can see is the Iraqi dugout and I'm way nearer to it than I should be. There's no activity. The dugout has taken a direct hit and there are bodies spilled. There's still no sign of Brewster, and should one single rifleman remain in the dugout, I'm exposed. I have two grenades, an L2 high X and a white phosphorus grenade. I decide to use the FOS bomb because as well as clearing anything within 50 yards of where it lands, it makes a good signal. I chuck it at the dugout and get down, keeping my eyes averted from the flash to avoid the after dazzle. The thing goes off, the smoke rises pretty quickly. After coming out of the, anything coming out of the dugout is going to walk straight into my line of fire. But there's nothing there. I hang in, still waiting to make eye contact with any of my boys. Visibility in the dust is fluctuating at maybe 20 to 30 yards, no more than that. And after the shock of my phosphor grenade, everything is quiet. I can't even hear the artillery up ahead and the flyovers have stopped altogether. I decide to wake up the radio. My radio, like all of them in our unit, is a piece of shit, 20 years old and it's fucked, and we've reported it fucked and got no replacement gear. I have to make several calls before someone in my warrior picks me up. Who's that? I ask. Fox, where are you? I'm at the dugout. Where's Echo and Valiant? These are the call signs for Brewster and Cummings. Normal names are prohibited over the radio. They've lost you, Cobra. Did you see my flash? Flash? Foss bomb, you fucking idiot. You couldn't fucking miss it. If you can't raise Echo and Valiant, send me two other lads to clear this dog out. This is bad radio procedure. Normal conversation is also prohibited. We're on a close, closed net at short range, and I'm getting mighty irritated with everything. No flash, Cobra. Give me your last coordinates. I sit back and wait. The thick yellow cloud of sand and dust is like a gas, a sulfurous fog. I still can't see more than about 30 yards. No one comes. I radio again. 
We can't find you, Cobra, they say. For fuck's sake, I'm going to lob my high X. Follow the fucking bang, you useless twat. Sergeant. I do just that. If there was anything alive in the dugout, it's probably mince by now. I radio again. No bang, Sergeant. What? No bang. We're looking. We're listening. Sit tight. I wait for another half an hour. What bothers me is that there's no sound from anywhere in the desert. Pretty unusual, I'd say, what with a war going on. The distant artillery has stopped. It doesn't make sense. I radio again, but this time I can't get a signal at all. My instincts convince me that the dugout is clear up ahead, and I do what I tell my boys never to do, and I make a solo approach. Not because I'm feeling brave, but because I'm bored. I'm in the middle of combat and I'm bored. And when I'm bored, I start thinking too much and that scares me more than the enemy. The dugout is well sandbagged and there is a big black broken gun blasted halfway over the sandbags. I can smell the oil and the ripped steel. I approach silently, slowly from the rear. The dugout is clean. And when I say clean, I mean there are no live enemy. Plenty of dead ones. Nothing done by my grenades, though, because they're all shrunk. Shriveled bodies like I've seen before. Shrunk with their original shadows scorched into the dust. Scat scattered particles of my WP are still smoking. But no one's going anywhere. I kick over the mess cans and check around. There's nothing of useful intelligence and I need to return to my unit. The problem is, I don't know where my unit is and my radio is still on the blink. I go outside the dugout to climb the rise to see if I can get a better signal. Maybe 10 yards from the sandbags, I hear a click. Things that never happen in real life. You see those war movies, maybe Vietnam, where a soldier steps on a mine and they cut to the expression on his face as he realises what he's done. There's a pause. Boom. Now. Nah doesn't happen. You step on a modern mine and there's no pause and you've no face left to have an expression. You know nothing about it. But I step on something and there's a loud click. I don't know what it is but I can feel a metal plate under my foot. I've trodden on something and I've triggered a spring release mechanism. I have no idea what this is. It may be a mine, it may be an improvised booby trap. But I know that if I don't keep my foot down on it, it's going to blow my leg off, and maybe a lot more. The point is, I'm stuck. I'm not going anywhere. Now this is an interesting situation. With the yellow smog, visibility is still down about 20 yards or so, but should any Iraqis come stumbling through that dust, I'm a dead man. Should I lift my foot, I'm a dead man. I can't see what it is I've trodden on, but I can certainly feel the hard metal shape under my size 9 boot. Maybe it's a mine that has malfunctioned. Maybe it's some old piece of crap the Iraqis left over from their desert war with Iran, and it's not going to blow. I have no way of knowing. I feel a maggot of sweat run along my spine. My mouth is full of dust. Keeping my foot in place, I get on the radio. Miraculously, I patch through at the first attempt. Cobra, where are you? Listen carefully, I've stepped on a mine. Fuck, are you all right? No, listen, it hasn't gone off. I've got my foot on it and I can't go anywhere or it will detonate. Fuck, don't move your foot. You dickhead, I'm not moving my foot anywhere. I need you to find me pronto. I need someone to work out how to get me out of this. Tom, what are your coordinates? Exactly what I gave you last time. Can't be, Sergeant, we've been all over there looking for you. Speak with Brewster, he was the last man I saw. That's exactly what we did, Sergeant. Well, fucking do it again, I'm getting a bit fucking warm out here, Corporal. Sergeant. Tell you what, I'll fire three rounds, wait 15 seconds, then fire a further three rounds. You listen for me. Won't be easy in this noise, Sergeant. And I'm thinking, what noise? There is no noise. The desert is completely silent. And then I realise at the back of Corporal Middleton's radio voice, I can hear artillery booming. I end radio contact and I fire three rounds into the air. 
I count to 15 and do the same again. I try to radio Middleton to get confirmation, but all I get on the airwaves is angry static. Hoping they can locate me from my gunfire, I wait, with my hot foot on the mine. In the heat and dust of the desert, in full combat gear, with the sweat trickling inside my helmet, my vest, and in my groin, I wait, and I wait, and no one comes. I'm on alert, and my automatic rifle is primed in case an Iraqi turns up out of the dust and spots me standing there. I think about getting down on one knee to give my limbs a break, but I'm afraid that the slightest easing of pressure from the spring mechanism will detonate the mine. Eventually, I have to do something, and I do lower myself on one knee, but only by resting my gun arm across the thigh bearing over the mine and forcing my entire weight down on that leg. I stay in this position for over two hours. The radio crackles with static, but nothing else. At one point I lose my patience and belly out, bellow out loud, Brewster, where are you, you little shite hawk? Brewster! Nothing. No one. Not even a sound. My leg is cramping up badly, so I return to standing position. By now I've run through every possibility for getting myself out of this. I have the weight of my pack, equipment and weapon, but I can't risk manipulating it all onto the mine in the hope that it's heavy enough. With gear weighing roughly 50 pounds, I even try to make a calculation, but I've no way of knowing what force I'm bearing on the mine under my foot. I reckon that if and when the boys turn up, they will have the gear to clamp the mine or to weight it or to get me out of my boot somehow without the thing triggering. I take off my helmet. Even though my head is shaved, it's caked in sweat and grit. I have weird sensations running up and down my leg. A horrible feeling of lightness is in my foot, as if it's threatening to float up, quite against all my intentions for it to stay bearing down on that metal plate. Then, a red admiral comes by. I mean a butterfly. One of those beautiful rare ones you sometimes see in an English country garden. I didn't even know you got them in the desert, and I think... Well, there ain't much green round here for you, is there? I'm glad to see it. It takes my mind off the situation for a few seconds as it flutters by. And then it turns back towards me and it settles on my wrist. Beautiful. I wonder if this is the last thing I'm going to see. I do believe it drinks the sweat from my wrist. It opens its wings and just stays there, quite happy. There you are, drinking sweat from a man with his foot on a mine. What's that all about? That's not bad, I think. If that's the last thing I'm going to see, a Red Admiral. I can think of a lot of things lower down my list. Have you ever looked hard at one? They're strange. They look like they're looking back at you. Like they're holding this cloak open for you to see. Rubbish, I know, but I start to think about keeping the Red Admiral alive. You don't want to stay there too long, old pretty. You're in the wrong place. You don't want to stay there. I flex my hand gently, but it doesn't move. It's still drinking my sweat. And when it beats its wings to fly away, I watch it go. I track it for several yards to the vanishing point where the yellow dust closes in around me. But it seems to stay fluttering in the air, the tiniest red dot. And then the red dot changes. And I realise the red dot I was looking at isn't the tip of a butterfly's wing at all. It's the red dot of an Arab's shemar scarf, the traditional headscarf, and the Arab wearing it is making his way towards me. <laughs>